The act of murder is a terrifying thought. The taking of someone's life is among the most extreme and terrible things one person can do to another. For many of us, this action is deplorable, and our very society is based on ideals of justice for those who have their lives taken from them. And in truth, most murder cases are resolved. More often than not, the perpetrator is caught. However, this is not always the case. Sometimes, for a multitude of reasons, cases go unsolved, with the killer remaining at large, free from justice, free to continue life among the rest of us in everyday society, a right which they robbed from their victims. In today's episode, we'll examine three terrifying murder cases that remain unsolved. Adam, the torso in the Thames. On September 21st, 2001, the torso of a young black male was found in the River Thames in London, England. With no head and no limbs, the child, estimated to be between four and seven years of age, was dubbed Adam by police. The autopsy of Adam revealed an unnerving clue to his past when it was found that ground down plant matter particles, grain resembling sand and clay pellets, and small traces of gold were found in the boy's stomach. The plant matter was later found to be seeds, one of which was a sedative that could cause hallucinations, whilst the other was from a toxic plant that caused paralysis. This led authorities to speculate that Adam may have been alive but paralyzed at the time of his murder. Further results showed Adam's throat had been slit to drain the body of blood, and his limbs and head had been removed with disturbing precision, likely from someone who had performed this kind of cuts before, and it was noted that the boy had only been in the UK for a few days before his murder. As the plants that were used on Adam were from West Africa, police theorized that he had been trafficked from Africa to the United Kingdom via Germany, a common route used by smugglers and a theory that felt more concrete when it was discovered that the orange shorts the child wore had been sold exclusively in German Woolworths stores. Authorities speculated that Adam was perhaps made a victim of a mooty killing, a practice in which mutilation and murder take place so that body parts can be used in medicines and concoctions for witchcraft. However, they struggled to find a lead given that Adam could not be identified through British or European databases. It seemed that he either hadn't been reported missing or, more chillingly, perhaps he wasn't even supposed to exist and was simply used for a ritual. Thus, he had no sort of birth record or anyone who cared for him. In 2002, officials flew to Johannesburg in Africa to attempt to identify Adam, appealing to the public for information before flying to Nigeria to try and find his parents. However, these attempts proved fruitless and authorities returned to the UK empty-handed. One suspect in the case was a Nigerian woman named Joyce Osagid, who was arrested by police in Glasgow. Clothing similar to the shorts that Adam was dressed in was found in the flat she resided in, and it was discovered that Joyce had flown to the UK via Germany using a false passport. She even spoke to authorities about human sacrifice. Joyce was not a blood relative of Adam's, and she provided an alibi that showed she was in Germany when the murder occurred. But still, police kept Joyce in mind as a person of interest. In 2011, 10 years after Adam's discovery, Joyce was approached again and claimed to have looked after Adam as a favor to a friend in Germany. She claimed his real name was Ik Pomwosa, and that she had handed him to a man named Bauer, who later told her 
Ike Pomwosa was dead. Joyce denied any involvement in the murder and told of how she doesn't know the group of people who killed Adam, but that they used him for a ritual in the water. Joyce showed reporters of an alleged photo of Adam, but it turned out that the image was of her friend's son, who is very much alive, and she later admitted that a misunderstanding had occurred. Two years later, Joyce amended her earlier statements by telling BBC News that Adam's name was, in fact, Patrick Ereber, and he was born in Nigeria. She looked after Patrick while in Germany. Joyce also revealed that Bauer, the man whom she gave Patrick to, was actually named Kingsley Ojo, a bogus asylum seeker who first came to London in 1997. He is also a convicted people smuggler and was deported back to Nigeria upon being arrested in the United Kingdom. Kingsley had been investigated in 2002 and found in his apartment was a mixture in a bag which resembled that which was found in Adam's stomach. He claimed that the bag didn't belong to him, nor did several other pieces of ritual themed evidence, including a video which showed an actor cutting off the head of another man, which was labeled ritual. Although charged in 2004 for human trafficking and sent to jail for four and a half years, no solid link has been made between Kingsley and the death of Adam. Most of the theories regarding the death of Adam revolve around him being murdered in a ritual sacrifice by a religious group. Some have even thought that perhaps Adam was bred specifically for the murder, hence why he was never listed as missing and no one came forward to claim him. Online sleuths wonder if maybe Adam's parents were the ones who murdered him, which again would account for the distinct silence surrounding his identity. Perhaps if he was murdered in some sort of religious ceremony, they felt it was their duty to carry out the killing. Kingsley Ojo is still considered a suspect by many and police don't seem to have ruled him out either. He was reported to have headed a large network of other smugglers and is thought to have snuck countless children and adults to work as slaves and prostitutes. Adam was buried in an unmarked grave in a London cemetery in December of 2006, and his funeral was attended by a small group of police and others who had worked on the case. Although it seems police finally have a possible name to put to Adam, 18 years following the death of the little boy, authorities have still failed to solve the case of who murdered him. Joan Culliano, born January 5th, 1950, internationally renowned scholar of the history of religion, Johann Culliano, had the world at his feet until someone took his life in 1991. Around 1 p.m. on May 21st, 1991, the body of the 41-year-old professor was found in the third floor men's room at the University of Chicago's Swift Hall. The murder was so well executed that a student who came into the bathroom moments later didn't even see a drop of blood, but he saw the arm of the professor from under the stall and called for help. Yoan had been murdered execution style, a single bullet shot from above through the head. Investigators theorized that the murderer hid in the cubicle next to him, perching on the lid of the toilet before pulling the trigger. The murder weapon, a 25 caliber pistol, has never been recovered. At the time of the murder, campus shootings were rarer than they are today, and most were carried out by disgruntled staff and students, but Yoan was described as a well-known, well-liked, charismatic, and funny man, and authorities could find no motive as to why any student or colleague would want him dead. Yoan was also engaged to be married, with no rivals or exes to give anyone a reason to harm him. Robbery was also ruled out as a motive, as nothing had been taken from the body. At first, police wondered if Yoan's death was linked to his scholarly interest in magic and the occult, as he studied witchcraft and transmigration of the soul, among other things. He was also somewhat of a practitioner, 
who performed tarot card readings and had a habit of making predictions that were found to be uncannily accurate. It was speculated that perhaps Yoan had come into contact with and made some dangerous enemies. At a lecture he gave in France concerning Renaissance magic, three self-described witches objected to his, quote, meddling in their realm. Both Yoan and his co-lecturer fell ill afterwards, and so too did several of the students present at the time. Upon the back of discovering this information, the FBI investigated whether an occult group may be responsible for the cold-blooded murder. Soon, this theory gave way to that which said Yoan's political ties were to blame for his death. A Romanian national, the professor had published several articles attacking the country's former communist government, as well as their post-communist regime. He was openly critical of both the far left and the far right political spheres. This is the most popular theory, with many speculating that the hit was carried out by intelligence agents with old communist ties. Some reports claim that Yuan had received threatening phone calls days prior to his death and that his apartment had been broken into as well. However, the area the professor resided in was known to have a high crime rate, so this could possibly be unrelated. The only spanner in the works of this theory is that many wonder why Yoan seems to be the only person targeted of the many who criticize the politics in Romania, both past and present. Whilst the police haven't ruled out this theory, it seems that they don't truly believe it. One Reddit user attests to have information that Yoan's death was drug related but there is no hard evidence to support this claim, and the death of Professor Yoan Culliano remains unsolved. The Norfolk Headless Jane Doe On August 27th, 1974, a tractor driver stumbled across the body of a woman in the overgrown grass by a track leading to Brake Hill Farm in the village of Cockley Clay England. The decomposed remains were a chilling sight, made worse by the fact that this Jane Doe was headless. Jane's hands and legs were bound to her body, and it was likely she died in either the first or second week of August 1974. She was estimated to be between the ages of 23 and 35, and was of a petite build theorized to have stood at full height at no more than five foot two. One of the most notable clues in the case was that Jane Doe wore a pink nightgown sold in Marks and Spencers in 1969. Another peculiar puzzle piece in the case was the plastic sheet wrapped around Jane's body. It was embossed with the National Cash Register's logo, a company known today as the NCR Corporation, who makes self-service and cash machines. A length of rope found by the body also gave investigators some important information to work with. When it was discovered, it was made with four strands, something which is rare, as rope is commonly made with either three or five strands. It was discovered that the rope was used for architectural machinery, and the manufacturer was traced to Dundee but the lead died out when it was found that the firm who'd created the rope had since gone out of business. Although police went to great lengths to try and identify Jane Doe and discover what happened to her, the trail quickly grew cold. In 2008, Jane's body was exhumed and investigators acquired new information about her from the new forensic techniques available. Isotopic analysis showed she was from Central Europe the window was narrowed down to four countries, Denmark, Germany, Austria, or Italy. Authorities also discovered that Jane had likely given birth once and had consumed Scottish water for a large part of her life. BBC's Crime Watch aired an episode featuring the case, also in 2008, but few tips came from this exposure. 
In 2016, students at Dundee's Abertay University attempted to garner information that could help the case through old newspaper archives and missing persons reports. And while police confirmed that these attempts had shed light on new leads, they did not elaborate on what the new information was. And nothing else seems to have happened in the case since. The most popular theory in the case of the Norfolk Headless Doe is that she was a sex worker named the Duchess. This tip came as a result of the 2008 Crime Watch episode, where a former policeman pointed investigators in the direction of the escorts. It was believed that the Duchess worked around the Great Yarmouth area in the mid 1970s, and her age was somewhere between her late 20s and early 30s, which would fit the estimated age of Jane Doe. Furthermore, the Duchess is allegedly from Denmark, and most of her regular clientele were truck drivers who traveled up and down the country and often gave her lifts where she needed to go. Interestingly, the Duchess spent time in police custody, but records from this era have been destroyed. And so no real name can be given to the escort or to Jane Doe, if indeed they are one and the same. There is very little information available on what actually happened to the Duchess. It's theorized that she was in some sort of trouble, which led to her flighty lifestyle. Perhaps she was murdered by one of her clients. It could even have been a driver transporting the NCR machinery. Perhaps her head was taken to stifle identification as the Duchess was well known, and maybe was even spotted with her killer prior to her death. Over four decades have passed since the discovery of the Norfolk Headless Doe, and yet her true identity still seems as elusive as ever. Even if Jane Doe is the Duchess, it seems that her true name will never be recovered. And there you have the facts. Please leave your own theories and speculations down in the comments section below. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.